uh, that God has a purpose for us. Amen. Amen. And, and in Acts chapter 2, that's our benchmark. I'm turning to Acts 6, but let me give you a little background. There are thousands that are added to the church when Peter preaches the message in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 3, there's the healing of the lame man. It gave beautiful and God unlocked supernatural gifting in the wasn't just for while he was on earth, but releases that power and potential to the disciples. And, and even Peter's shadow passing by, Scripture says, uh, causes healing to happen. And there's great stir and there's miracles and there's signs and there's wonder. A great miracle calls for a great help. And um, there's two ways that, that, that we can do uh, planning for revival. We can, you know, for believers, how many believers do I have in the room tonight? These signs shall follow them that believe. That's what scripture says. These signs will follow. And believers know that there's going to be an end time revival, a great end time revival. We know that. We believe that there will be. So believers can plan for what God's going to do. Or we can just kind of wait around for it to happen and then react to what God does. And uh, I think that part of what we're talking about tonight is and a part of what God has challenged us as a church to do just in the next coming months and year is that God is calling us to plan for a revival that he's going to bring to our city, plan for a revival that God is bring, going to bring to our, our nation, to our world. And I'm so privileged that we get to be a part of that. And, and uh, the Bible in the New Testament says that the Old Testament was written for our example. We're going to do a little looking into the Old Testament tonight. But we also know that the New Testament church is there for our example as well. That's why we are Acts 2 believers. We're an apostolic church. We don't live by a code of conduct or a creed. We live by the Word of God, what God called us to be. And, and we look for that original blueprint so we can model ourselves after that. Someone say amen. But we also have directive beyond Acts chapter 2. We have directive. And, and I shared some of this with our leadership staff, and a, or some of you even, in a, in a vision casting message. And, and let me just kind of launch one more time from that area, and, and then we'll go on a little bit tonight, if that's all right. Acts chapter 6, I know you're standing. Thank you for your patience. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, someone say revival. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Um, we don't want to be neglectful of anything that happens. And, and uh, you know, there's times when we, we understand that we've uh, dropped the ball or missed uh, information and, and not had the opportunity to respond maybe in the way that some people would have, ex would have expected us to respond. And, and that, that's a reality that we've got to deal with. That's a tension that we have to manage. I, I don't know that we'll ever solve that problem because we're people. Someone say we're just people. But the Bible goes on and it says, then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them. There was a group session and and they said, it's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you and take seven honest men of honest report and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, and, and, and we see that in Scripture there are seven men that are pulled from this congregation of disciples that are called alongside to help and aid in the call of what God has brought to the disciples of that day, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And verse 7 goes on, it says, And the word of God increased. Isn't that what we want? Just checking, uh, just checking tonight. Someone just kind of reality check or timeout, station identification. And the word of God increased, and then the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. Now, now we would take the number of disciples being added. We would take we would take that. But the scripture says that the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. We'll we're, we're, we'll take that. But then it goes a, a step further. It says the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. I'm ready for that kind of thing to happen. Anybody else want to want to see that kind of revival? The number of the disciples were multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. I I'd like to just exchange that for a moment tonight and say, and the number of disciples multiplied in Fredericton greatly. 
I'd like to see that happen. Any believers in the room believe that in the end time we could see uh, not a church that's falling away, not a church that's in decline, but a church that's on its way into God's purpose, on its way into God's plan, on its way into God's revival, on its way into seeing what God promised that he would do in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And you say, Pastor Jack, you quote that every time you get up. Yes, I will, because we have yet to see it, and until we see it, we'll make the vision plain, we'll clarify, we'll, come on, we'll. So tonight's message is not criticism, it's part con, uh, commendation, not condemnation. We have elements in place and we've got things in order. And, but I, I do believe that God is, is furthering the vision. I believe that God has taken us to the next level. So if you're ready to take some next steps with us tonight, I wonder if you just put your Bible down and put your hands in the air for a moment. We're inviting God to talk to us. We're inviting God to, to call us close. It's just that invitation about bringing the disciples together that we're having tonight. Father, we're asking. God, would you order our steps, but more than that, God, order God, order our speech tonight, order our words. God, put a guard at our mouth, and I pray, Father, that you would allow us the opportunity to present your word with boldness tonight. God, I pray that you would allow that boldness to be translated from the pulpit to the pew. God, I pray that someone would catch the vision, that somebody would pick up the torch of revival. God, I pray that somebody would catch a hold of what it is you're wanting us to become and, and what you're wanting us to do, Lord. I ask that a vision would be clarified and clarified and understood. And, and God, I pray that it would just be internalized in somebody tonight. In Jesus' name, we'll ask these things. Someone say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, you may be seated tonight. Amen. The church said amen. Amen. Uh, you know, I, I understand that when we're children, we, we learn the, the course when we all pull together. And uh, when we're children, we don't even really understand what that means. All we know is that it means that we stick our hands out and, and Sunday school teachers are chuckling. Because they, they know it's a song that they sing when we all pull together, together, together. Oh, you know it. When we all pull together, how happy we'll be. For your work is, and our work is, oh, it's not just a Sunday school song. It's a great lesson to learn by. It's a great lesson to kind of internalize so that later when God calls us, and God plants us in a place that it's not just a song, it's not just a nursery rhyme, it's not just something we learn when we were children, it's something we get to live when we're a part of God's family, we, when we all pull together. You know, and I, and I understand in, in finances, some people will never invest unless they're the owners. Some people have been burned and some people have been hurt and some people are just very cautious and careful. And how you run your finances, that's your responsibility. But can I just remind everybody that, that this is God's church? That he has purchased this church with his own blood? This is God's church. So, so uh, none of us can kind of step back and, and say, well, we're not going to invest because we're not the owner tonight. Because he owns this church. This is his church. He's purchased it. But he's very intent on people having the responsibility of running his church. He's given us the responsibility to be a church in this end time. And, and I thank God for the privilege of, of being a part of all of you and for what God has called us to do. That is a great and a tremendous privilege. But we get to do this together. Yeah. Glory. Going to be a little, little, little trudge here. John chapter 10 um, outlines two different levels of leadership. Uh, verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. So we have one level of leadership. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is in hireling and not the shepherd who, who's owned the sheep or not, sees the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. I, I like to say it this way. The hireling sees, leaves, and flees. Sees, leaves, and flees. But that's what the hireling does. And, and the wolf catches them and, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. But, but I, I do believe that God has put people in our 
our environment, that God has put people, let me say it this way, in our community, in Capital Community Church, because they're not a hireling. It's not about a hireling spirit. It's not about just kind of going through the motions or going through the activity or observing what's happening and then just kind of applauding when things go good or, or criticizing when things don't. I, I'm telling you that God has allowed us all to become a part of this, not just to be a hireling, but that, so that we can all have the heart of the shepherd. The heart of the shepherd is for the sheep. The hireling, when he sees that wolf, he, he, he just sees the wolf and he leaves and, and he flees. And, 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 and we see the, the pending result that the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. But on the flip side of that, we have this responsibility and, and we, see, we have this opportunity that if we are shepherds of the, the flock that God has allowed us to be a part of, if we have a shepherd's heart, that when the wolf comes, we're not going to leave and we're not going to flee, but rather we are going to bind together. We're going to Build a protective wall. We're going to become a part of that hedge that Pastor preached about on Sunday night. That we're going to be part of that protection that God erects to say, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, not here, not now. This is God's church. This is God's plan. There's a revival coming to this church. There's a revival coming to this city, and we're going to be a part of it." So, enemy, when you come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord is going to raise up a standard against you, and we're going to be part of that standard that God raises. We're going to be a part of that. We have a flip side to that, that, that the wolf doesn't have to just kind of demoralize and destroy the church, but rather we can become the ha- uh, somebody with the heart of a shepherd and not flee and put the devil on the run instead. That's what I'd like to see. Rather than the hireling fleeing, I tell you what, I'd rather see the tail of the devil going that way and the church rising up in authority and the church rising up in power and we get to be a part of that in this end time. So we have two different levels of leadership as our option. We can be a hireling or we can be a shepherd. Owners risk their lives to protect the sheep. They do. The shepherd protects the sheep. And, and that's our challenge uh, tonight. And, and uh, you know, some, some people, you've already kind of checked out because you said, well, that's your job. <laughs> not my, yeah. <laughs> not my job. Not my responsibility. It is. Can, can I just say it is not not. I'm not condemning anybody tonight. I'm not here to criticize anybody, but it is your responsibility. Somebody say, it's my responsibility. responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Owners risk their lives to protect the the sheep. And and our challenge is this. How do we cast vision that our church family will own to the very core of their being? How do we do that? I mean, we can just talk. Pastor, very clear. He's articulate. He's, 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 uh, He's, he's very able to, to, you know, to kind of get the words out there that everybody needs to hear. And, and uh, I'll give it my best kick at the can. I'll give it my best shot. I'll, I'll do what I can. And, but, but it's not just about talking. It's not just about hearing, but it's, it's about hearing and doing. And, and it's about this receptivity on the other end that says, you know what? I hear you, Pastor Jack. I, I hear you, Pastor Wood. I hear you, Pastor Matt. I hear what you're saying. And, and not just there. Don't limit leadership to what happens in, in this pulpit. But there are Sunday school teachers that, that are leading the charge. And there, there are people that, that we've called and we said, look, we, we need some help in the new year because we're, we're launching a new approach to growing the church. We're, we're going to take a great big church and we're going to make it small. And, and we're going to do small groups and we're going to establish some roots in areas of our city so that, so that we don't just become so local and central to this location, but rather that God can do a work all across our city. I tell you, there's something marvelous and miraculous about that. So, so when we cast that call, uh, we're looking for people to say, that sounds like a good plan, Pastor Jack. I, I'm not going to have a hireling spirit when you present that. I'm going to have the heart of the shepherd and say, what can I do? How can I help the work of God go forward? I mean, own it to the very point of sacrificing deeply, or better still, to live for it. Sometimes we're so focused on, would you be willing to die for this? And I think that we do need to be willing to die for this. But the flip side of that question is, are you willing to live for this? Would you put your life into it? Would you put your energy into it, your time and your effort and, and your, your morning, waking morning moments where you give them to God and then say, God, how can I help the church of God go forward today? What kind of a vision is it that people will be willing to lay their very lives down for? Because people that have a vision, they'll pray for it, they'll work for it, they'll sacrifice it for it. They're, they're willing to 
You know, I, I've seen some of those, um, and I told the, <clears throat> the folks that met with us on the vision cast, and, I, and some of you just bear with me for a moment. We had a friend that, that, um, that he started a beard oil business. Matt and Christy White, they, they, we hosted their church in our youth chapel and on Sunday afternoons for a little while when they were kind of displaced from the Heritage Center. And, and uh, Matt kind of went into this deal where he did this, this business about selling beard oil. I don't know what it's all about. Um, I can't go any longer than a day or my, yeah. Anyhow, next. So I, I watched the, there was a, a, a show called The Dragon's Den. Apparently the people present their business plan and opportunity and then they have some of the four tycoons of Canada that, that kind of examine the business plan and the model and, and the evaluation and, and then they buy in or they don't buy in and and uh, Matt, Matt, actually, they, they bought into his business plan. He, he sold them. I don't know. My, my, that's where I lost touch with it. But, but I, I remember uh, watching through some of the other business proposals. And, and, and the conversation was usually, you know, this is what I'm, I'm offering the business plan for. And, and here's what I'm, I'm offering for you to buy in at. And, and the evaluation, so many times I just heard them say, well, your evaluation is way too high. Why? Because the business owners have invested everything. In and different times they would say, well, what have you got invested in your business? You know, what have you got invested in this business? And they would say, well, I, I sold my car and I sold my house and remortgaged everything that we had and pulled out all my RSPs. I've got everything I own into this business. And, and the, the, business, the, the smart business people were saying, but people would literally invest everything that they have to promote a business idea that may not even be good. We get to present the greatest business plan that the world has ever known. There are eternal dividends that never end. There are immediate benefits to the gospel. The Great Commission is an immediate return. It, it pays you back instantly the moment you're buried in his name. You come up a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. The moment that he fills you with his spirit, he puts the power on the inside of you to lift you out of a world full of sin to be part of the church that he's going to rapture someday. I'm telling you, it is, it's great payback. We get to sell the greatest business opportunity the world has ever seen. But it's going to take us investing everything that we have. In Acts chapter 6, that's, that's what was happening. The, the work of God was growing, but, but the distribution of responsibility was shrinking. Then uh, the disciples were left with more and more to do and less people were stepping to the table to do it. As a matter of fact, that, that just kind of created the environment for them to begin to complain about what wasn't getting done. And someone finally had to shake their head and it was like, well, you know, the church has grown, but the disciples haven't. We picked a, you know, we picked a 12th disciple to, to fill in Judas's place, and, and we kind of got, got those people back in order, but 12 disciples wasn't going to do the work that God was doing from Acts chapter 5 cha and chapter 6. God had this miracle, miraculous revival occurring, and, and the responsibility had to grow with the church. And our capital community church. And we want to see God's great revival. But it means that we all have to, when we all pull together. We all have to pull together. We all have to pull together. And, uh, you know, I, I know that, you know, I, I'll just, case in point, I, we were just with Pastor Ken Elliott, great church in Manchester, Connecticut, and, and uh, was with him for their mission service. And, and I thank you people for giving us the courage to stand in front of people and ask them to, to invest in the kingdom of God because you have modeled that in such a remarkable way. And we have confidence when we step before people that, that uh, God's not going to let them down and that if they give by faith, that God meets them where they are and God's going to order their steps and plan their finances. Thank you for that. Can I just thank you for that tonight? I'll give you honor tonight. And, and it gives us great confidence when we, when we uh, challenge another church uh, on that missions level that, that they can do it. Because we have a great church at home that does it. And it's not just one person or five people. It's about everybody pulling together. So, so this isn't all criticism tonight. We're, I'm commending you tonight. But, but I, I, one thing I did notice about that, that church, great church, 
um, is that <clears throat> immediately following the Sunday morning service, Pastor Elliot, he, he was there at the back of the church, and I just saw him reach over, and, and there was a closet there, and he grabbed a vacuum. He said, hey, can you get, get, uh, get a, be a part of the team that's cleaning the sanctuary? Pass it to a young person. I turned around, looked in the sanctuary, and there, there were five young people going with vacuums. Ding, 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 ding. They each picked a section. Ding, 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 ding. And in about 10 minutes, the entire sanctuary was clean, ready for Tuesday night service. Wow. When we all pull together when we all pull together so acts, acts chapter 6 is about this distribution of of responsibility and and uh and it takes everybody working together but it also is about us owning that vision and and we understand that vision you know uh it, it isn't immediate it's it's a i'm not even going to use the word yet the answer has to do with the word that most of us hate a seven letter word most people recoil from it it's the word process. Or maybe, for some of you, process. I don't know where the A is in that process, but, but it's a word that feels so slow that it, it, it can't be God because he's the God of the instantaneous and the miraculous, so the, the, that word can't be from God, but it's interesting that he's also the God of seeds and seasons and Babies and bodies, they all grow at a slow rate of adjustment. He is, in fact, a God of process. And uh, often, we haven't even had the chance to process vision before it's been declared. We, you know, traditionally, we have looked to a fearless leader to lead us. Thank God for great leadership, which we need. But, but in that experience and, and, and in our effort, we have subjected ourselves to being limited to a marginal group of people who have 100% heart and 100% faith simply because we asked. And, and we understand also that not everybody is like that. So that's part of the reason we're talking tonight about what God has called us to do. And it, 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 I'll sum it up in three words. We need you. I could just title the whole message, We Need You. You say, well, that's not for me tonight. Man, I could have stayed home, salted the driveway, because that's for... Would you look at your neighbor and say, We need you. We need you. And I, I know that <clears throat> traditionally we've, we've asked and allowed the leader to act unilaterally, independently in the area of cultivating and casting vision. And we, we, we look to Exodus chapter 19 and 20. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And, and Moses went up. And every leader wants that moment of Moses moment. Mount Sinai moment. We, we want that moment where, where God meets with us and gives us the word. We want that. Because that's how it's worked in the past. So for, for some of us, that's how God got us here. It was a leader that, that met with God and shut himself in with God. And, and there's, there's something powerful about that and, and necessary about that. But it grows beyond that. As a matter of fact, if you were to look in, in Exodus chapter 18, and, and, and if you study this out, I've got 16 pages that I went through today about uh, the leader that I want to talk to you about in just a moment, I, I went through uh, 16 pages and I printed it all out. And, and I think you'll be glad that I'm not going to share it all with you. So there was the Mount Sinai experience, but, but you'll find that that wasn't the only time God brought leadership to Israel. And I'm very grateful for, uh, for my leadership, for my pastor, Pastor Uber. And, and we need that level of leadership to call and cast vision. But there's a next level leadership. And I'm not even saying it's less than. I'm saying it's a part of what God has called us to do, where we all pull together. Look at your neighbor one more time and say, we need you. You know, um, sometimes I think when we only take those moments and present vision personally, that we... We never allow people to own the vision because they aren't part of, what's that word again, that seven-letter word? All right. I knew it. Process. Thank you. Yes. 
Because sometimes when it's only just declared, it's impossible for people to own it. But there is something powerful about when we dialogue together about it. And the vision is formed not just from the pulpit, but it's formed in our lives and in our pews. There's something very powerful that happens in those moments. And uh, so we have the Exodus 19, and some would say, well, Exodus 19 comes after Exodus 18, but if you'll do a little research, you'll find that Exodus 18 is inserted in the scripture out of chronological order there because it's a, a leadership lesson for all of us. Exodus 18, verse 5, it says, And Jethro, this is Moses' father-in-law, and I'll tell you, verse 1 tells us he was a priest of Midian. Midian was one of Abraham's sons. It says that when he heard of all that God had done, he came with his sons and his wife, Moses' wife, and his, Moses' sons, into the wilderness where he encamped at the Mount of God. And verse 6, he said, And he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law Jethro, am come unto thee and thy wife and her two sons with her. And scripture begins to intentionally build up the profile of Jethro. Uh, I, 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 I played with the idea about maybe calling this lesson tonight just a guy named Jethro. But I didn't figure that would play out. I think someone would be looking for uh, the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> and find it. Um, scripture intentionally builds up the profile of Jethro here in these verses. Now, now look, he, he, he was a priest of Midian. Now, this is the guy, think with me, just think with me for a moment. Let's put our thinking cap on. This is the guy that saw the potential in Moses. He believed in him before the burning bush experience, before the call of God was on his life. Jethro saw a man who refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, true, but he also took in a murderer and said, go ahead and marry my daughter. Do the math on that just for a minute. Jethro was the guy who looked past Moses' failings and said, I see potential. I see opportunity. I see, a, I see the call of God. I see God doing, <clears throat> God activating his plan. And I see something powerful. And, and God's hand was on Jethro from the very beginning of Scripture, where Scripture begins to introduce us to him. And, and we see here in this, in this verse that, that Jethro's heard about what God has done. And, and, and I would also add that Jethro believed that God could do that through Moses before anybody else did. Jethro saw that in that man, Moses. And Jethro then goes out to meet him in, in Exodus, 17, or Exodus 18, verse 7. God's still building up the picture of Jethro in, a, in, in the scripture. It says, and Moses went out. Moses could have sat tight. He could have waited for, <clears throat> for Jethro to get to him because Moses is the great leader. Moses has the thousands upon thousands of Israel to look to him. Moses could have just kind of waited for him to show up. But it says that Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare. And then it says, and they came into the tent. And theologians think that this isn't just any tent, but rather that this means the tabernacle, which means that Jethro would have had the spiritual right to walk into that place of tabernacle where God's presence was. So he's a very, he's not just, a, he's not just your average father-in-law. I've got a great father-in-law. But he is, <clears throat> he is empowered by God for this moment. He is gifted by God for this season. And it says, that, so he, he just begins to, and Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians. And, and I'll skip ahead how the Lord delivered them. Verse 9, and Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. Verse, skipping down to verse 11. And he, he, he said, now I know, Jethro said, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Midian, that place where Jethro grew up, Midian was one of the sons of Abraham as well. And, and without doubt, Jethro knew the proper God. He knew who God was. He knew God's ability. He knew God's power and God's authority. And God brings him to the season, this season, this story for this time. And, uh, and so we have this picture, all the elders of Israel together, Moses <clears throat> is there, and, and Jethro's there, and, and they're celebrating what God has done, they're rejoicing about the goodness of God, and, and, and so 
He's not just another guest. He has a place of authority and he has a, a place of honor. Jethro is somebody important. And verse 13 says that it comes to pass on the morrow that Moses goes to do his usual thing. He sat in the judge, he sat to judge the people, and, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. My Lord. And when Moses' father in law, when Jethro sees all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thyself? Why sittest thyself? Thank you. Why are you doing this by yourself? That's not God's plan. That's not God's intention. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Moses, Mount Sinai, that's, that's a, an incredible opportunity. That's an incredible experience. But this, this work that God has called you to do, you're not supposed to do it alone. Moses put a perimeter around Mount Sinai. He said, you can't come up. You're not allowed to come near. You're not allowed to be here. But I tell you what, when it came to this work of God that Moses was doing, all of a sudden Jethro, God, God used Jethro to come to this place to say, uh-uh, you aren't supposed to do this alone. This isn't supposed to be just you. This isn't supposed... Moses, you can't accomplish this work by yourself. Why sittest thou alone and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? How many know what it's like to try and do something by yourself? I, 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 yeah, and, and wish that you had some help? Now I got y'all. There, there, there are some people that just refuse to do anything by themselves. You know, I, I like to try and be uh, ingenious. I like to try and be, in, you know, use your brains to get the job done. And, and there's a lot you can accomplish by yourself. As a matter of fact, I, I don't recommend just sitting around waiting for it to happen. I, I recommend that you kind of get up and get going. And, but the other thing I recommend is don't go about it alone. And I, like, I, I get it. We live in a we live in a culture and we live in a society and we live in an age where, honestly, part of the fear of us not doing this by ourselves is that we're going to end up owing somebody, isn't it? Now, I'm not going to help him because, or, sorry, I'm not going to ask him to help me. There we go. I'm away from my notes. Can you tell? <laughs> I'm not going to ask him to help me because that means that I'm going to have to help him. And I know what that means. I'm going to ask him to help me sweep the floor. And he's going to help me. He's going to ask me to come and help him move 600 concrete blocks. <laughs> so I'm just going to play it safe. So Moses, he's kind of, you know, if you'll read through the verses, he, he may have a little ego problem at this point. I don't know, because he uses the word I an awful lot. But verse 15, it says, And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Jethro, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. Today's vernacular, because I'm the leader. Why? Because I'm the leader. He said, when they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between one another. And I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And, and, and listen, and Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. It's not good. It's not good that you do this by yourself. And he said, verse, you know, Scripture has just built us up this proper picture of Jethro so that we'll receive what Jethro has to say. Thou wilt surely, verse 18, thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. This thing is bigger than one person. This thing is bigger than two people. This thing is bigger than three people. This thing is bigger than four or five. This thing is bigger than 20, 50, or even 100 people. This, this thing that God has called us to do is going to take every one responding. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. 
Verse 19, now hearken unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, and thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. We do this, check, we do that. But moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, women of truth. We're not excluding you tonight. Uh, hating covetousness and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And God just breaks it down. There are, gonna, there are, there are some people among us that are rulers of thousands. And there are some people among us that are rulers of hundreds. And, and there are people among us that are rulers of 50. And, and then there's people among us that are rulers of tens. God has gifted everyone with a specific level of leadership. So, so don't get kind of sideways when, when we aren't at the level when, where we may want to be, but where God called us to be right here, right now. And, and serve in that capacity and pull together in that moment and watch what God begins to do. When 10 people work together with 10 people, guess what? We've got 100 people working together. That's a powerful church right there. What a powerful unit when 100 people work in harmony, when we all pull together. And then you got people that are with 50 and you got five of them and you got 250 people plus 100 and you got 350 people and then you got people over hundreds and, and then you got people over thousands. God has a plan for great revival if we will all pull together. Amen. Pull together. We can't, uh, you know, the, here, here's the key. If thou shalt do this thing, verse 23. If thou shalt do this thing and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Wow. If God said that, and I believe that God has said, and, and part of this, this focus for our new year is because we know I think that God has, has grown us to this season. I don't think this is a hard right turn from what we've always been. This is a progression. Someone say process. This is part of the process of God leading us into this place. But it's getting to the point now where, where God's saying, start extending the 10 pegs. Let's get ready because you've got leaders waiting to lead. And you've got people waiting to be a part of what I've called you to become. I'm getting excited right now. I'm excited about what God's going to do in this brand new year. I'm excited about how this is going to roll out. And, and when we begin to hear about revival reports coming in, why? Because people are working together. When we all pull together, how happy we'll be. Amen. So here's one of the keys. We can't do this for you. You need to engage personally. We can't do this for you. Why? Because God said this thing's too big for us. So we need people that are willing to say, you know what, I'll be a part of what God is doing in this. There isn't anything more important that you do in a week than this. We can't do this for you. We, we can't do it physically for you. I can't carry you. I can barely carry myself. We can't do it spiritually. You heard the call in the supernatural on Sunday night to prayer. Why? Because this spiritual level that God is calling us to. You can't have a couple people praying for you. I, 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 we want to pray for you. We'll pray for you. And when we have a need and we have a call and, and when there's a, a, someone for the church to gather together, we're going to do that. But, but, but we all need to pray together. When we all pray together, watch what happens, how happy we'll be. When, and spiritually, we've got to do this. So we, we can't do this financially by ourselves. We all need to pull together financially. You say, well, I can't give as much as my neighbor, but you know what? That doesn't matter. It isn't about how much you give. God doesn't grade on, on the amount. He grades on your sacrifice. What's the percentage that, that you give? What's, what's, what, what, you, what do you have left? Not what you put in. God, financially, we need everybody pulling together. Emotionally, we need everybody pulling together. Well, I don't think that's going to be a very good idea. I guess we'll just wait and see. I'll tell you. I don't know whose voice that is. Not mine. 
Come on, emotionally. What happens when someone just gets a little bit excited about some change and transition and say, you know what, let's give this our best shot. The, the, I, I believe that this is going to work. I believe there's something behind this. I, I think if God thought it was good and, and, and we thought it's good uh, in the natural and in the Holy Ghost, we think it's a, a good idea. So let's get behind and push and watch what happens when we all pull together. Watch what happens. How happy we'll be. We got small groups that we're kicking off. Someone say, yes. Yeah. We, got, we got construction in the lower auditorium that we need to do. Come on. When we all pull together. Huh. Now, if I know what's going to happen. I'm going to show up one time. I'm going to be there for the next nine months. Maybe. No. No. But when we all pull together, guess what? The workload gets lighter. The responsibility gets, gets surrounded and, and people bear that load together. We bear one another's burden. I think that we begin to become the body of Christ working together. Your hand isn't out in the yard working all by itself. You've got to carry it out there to shovel that snow. Guess what? When we all work together, you've got gifts that I haven't got. You've got abilities that I don't have. Your neighbor is able to do some things that you, don't, you, that you can't do, but you can do some things that your neighbor can't do. So guess what happens when we all show up? All gets done. It all gets done. I'm excited. I'm excited about the plans that we have. And the pastor's going to be, be, be bringing it to us, and, and it's a, a job that we can't do without you. We, you know, every church needs the, 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 the backbone of its body to accomplish the task that it's called to do. Every church does. Or else it just goes into decline. So we've got construction. We've got prayer that we all need to pull together in. The vision that, that God is casting for us right now, we all need to pull together. And there's something powerful about when we all pull together. When we all pull together. Ryan, you can come back to the music. I'm getting... Getting ready to close tonight. And uh, some of you have heard some of this already, but on behalf of many of you, we have initiated a process of analyzing our activity and, and dissecting our calendar and processing our attendance and looking at numbers and crunching uh, ideas and, and separating the meat from the bones in meetings. And we're, we're trying to create a better picture of what we are so we can paint a better picture about what we need to become and and, uh, and sometimes that's hard because we have to truly analyze what we're doing. And we have to measure its effectiveness. And, and how do you quantify ministry? You can. But the Lord leads us and God guides us and says, here's the next step to take. And, and that's hard for leaders. That's hard for me. Because sometimes I say, well, I can go faster alone. But what did Jethro say? It's not good. I can go faster alone. I can, get, I can go way faster all by myself. Anyone ever done a sack race? Case and point. <laughs> Brother Calhoun, say amen. <laughs> but I tell you what, I can go way farther with you than I can go faster alone. Look at your neighbor one more time and say, we need you. Vision formation, there's two different approaches for vision formation. It's, there's declaration and then there's discussion. We need both. And, and discussion isn't about disappointments and discussions about how. If we make a decision, you know, that, that's, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, we bang some stuff out in the boardroom. And I know sometimes people are processing. That's part of processing. It's people analyzing the people saying, how, how is this going to work? And that's good. But by the time we get to here, like December, about what we're doing in January, here's what we need. Let's do this. When we all pull together. Here's a question I asked uh, those that met on the vision casting night. Design. 
all the sound room is, is scrambling when we all pull together. <laughs> Here's the question. What does God want our church <laughs> to look like five years from now? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure that's part of it. <laughs> Oh, man. Can we stand and ignore the light? What does God want our church to look like five years? Someone say our. Not my. Not pastors. Not, not some brand or identification. But what, God, what does God want our church to look like five years from now? That, that's the question. People overestimate what they can do in a year, but underestimate what we can do in five years. I believe that God can change our community, change our city in five years. I believe, I believe that that can happen. We're, we're, we're changing some structure and we're changing some schedules and, and some people maybe you won't like it because some people, change is hard. But come on, let's all pull together and, and, and let's see what God will do with some adjustments, with some transition, with some change. And when God shakes up the comfort zone, when he just kind of stirs our nest up a little bit, maybe it's so that we can soar into a brand new place that we've never been before. Maybe that's why. Maybe God is kind of shaking it up a little bit. And, and yes, it's disturbing and it becomes uncomfortable, but it's because God has taken us to a new level. We're going to fight some new devils in that place. But God is taking us further. We're going to go a lot further when we go together. Come on, this Capital Community Church. God is calling us. We're asking people to open your homes and create a strong bond of community in our church family. We're in the process of making a great big church small because we need connection and we need community. So we need all of you to buy in when we all pull together. It's exciting. It's exciting. It's exciting. I... I have a few pages, but you know, I, I think that the message is there and I feel that response. I feel that, that giving back tonight. The vision tonight is about involvement. Become a part of what God is calling us to do. Just turn to your neighbor one more time. Say, when we all pull together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the work that you're doing. God, I give you great praise for the heritage and the history that we that we lean on and we look back to. God, I thank you for doctrine, that anchor that holds us. And God, we aren't moving one, God, one millimeter away from anything that we believe doctrinally. But God, as we make some changes to be, God, to extend the borders of involvement in our church community. God, when we invite leaders to that place that you've gifted them to become. Leaders of 10 and leaders of 50 and leaders of 100. God, leaders, I believe, of thousands in our, God, in our congregation right now. God, that you're going to direct us. You're going to order our steps. I pray, God, that as you bring Jethro's into our lives to cast vision and, and bring course correction, God, I ask that, that we would respond because this thing is too big for any one of us. And so, God, I pray that people would feel the burden. God, I feel that people would feel that, that vision that, that we sense, that we see in the, na in the supernatural and, and make it a reality in the natural. God, I thank you for that call that we sense to, to become what you want us to be. Let us be an apostolic church in an end time age. God, I pray that we'd be holy and righteous. God, that our garments wouldn't be spotted with sin. But God, that we'd be that bride that you're coming back for. But, but God, I believe that you want this church to be bigger because that means more people are a part of your kingdom in the end time. And God, I give you thanks for that. I thank you for every heart that signed up. God, not just for, God, for people that are, are observing. But God, I thank you for shepherds hearts that are in this room tonight i ask that that you'd lead us god as we prayerfully consider what you are calling us to do i pray that people would pray with us and god that you would divinely ordain the steps before us god let your word be a lamp to our feet and god be a light to our path holy ghost empower us and gift us we pray in your precious name we'll ask these things and the church said amen amen